Let's go to Matthew chapter 4. Now, today we conclude what has been, uh, to me, a life-changing series. I have learned principles out of Matthew chapter 4 that I certainly did not know before digging in and studying this passage. You know, the temptation of Christ is a very familiar piece of Scripture, but similar to what was our former series, the armor of God, in a similar way, I thought I understood the armor of God quite well until we did our eight-week series on it, and I found out I knew very little by the time it was finished. And, oh, how God just uh, continues to teach me things out of Ephesians 6. And I think Matthew 4 is the same way. When we do series like this, it's not like we just drop it and we're on to the next thing. I continue to learn and my life changes. My perception changes. The way that I view life and how I handle circumstances. It, it, God's word changes those things. And that's why it's so important. Our music, I think, is phenomenal. But that's why God's designed his body far more than just music or dinners like we're getting ready to do. We, as Jesus said, and we learned this, we live by every word, rhema word, that proceeds out of the mouth of God, right? Scripture sustains us. And I find that more and more true as I face more challenges with my vision and as I face more challenges with my health, then I'm finding more and more, I, 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 I'm not sustained by what my physical body does or does not do. I'm sustained by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. My strength isn't where my vision, no, my strength is in the Lord. Amen? So I'm thankful for what I'm learning. And by the way, I went to my doctor this week and guess what? My numbers were perfect. Amen. And he said, whatever you're doing, you just keep on doing it. And, and guess what I'm doing? It's actually working. Do you know when I cheat? Do you know when I cheat? It's only on days that the Tennessee Volunteers win. So uh, I don't cheat very often here lately. It's, it's so if you're looking for a good diet plan, you may want to join mine. I call it brick by brick. And uh, <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm a fan. I can joke. If you're not a fan, you're not allowed to. Okay. We'll, we'll ask you to leave the church. Okay. So, but I'm a fan, so it's okay. <laughs> All right. So anyways, back to the point. This has been a life-changing series for me. And I hope it has been for you as well. Today we conclude Matthew chapter 4. We have worked our way all the way through verses 1 through 8. Now you remember in week 1, we were only in verse 1. In that sermon, we talked about the difference between test and temptations. We learned that temptations originate from within and they are meant to cause us to fall but tests originate from without, and they are meant to cause us to grow. Temptations come from the enemy, tests come from God. And in that sermon, we saw why the Spirit led Christ into the wilderness. We saw that after Christ's greatest accomplishment up to that point, which was his baptism in Matthew chapter 3, then the Spirit led him into his greatest opposition. And so it is in our life sometimes. You get serious about God. You, you, your family begins to plug in to church and into the things of God. And you find yourself praying more. And you find yourself getting into God's word. And you find yourself not like with one foot in and one foot out. It's like, no, I, I'm going to get serious about this thing. Well, guess what? That's when your greatest opposition will often come. And that's what we learned in week one. In week two, beginning in verse number two, we saw the first temptation that Christ handled. And the first temptation was Satan coming to him after he had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. And the Bible said he was hungry. And Satan says to him, you have the power. Turn these stones into loaves of bread. And what we learned in that sermon is that the same temptations that Christ, that Christ dealt with, the same temptations that Satan brought to him are the same temptations that you and I face today because Satan has a very short playbook. And Christ forever exposed the playbook of Satan for every believer of every generation. 
And if we can follow Christ's pattern and if we can understand how he modeled how to handle temptation, then you and I can overcome the temptations of our life every time if we learn from Christ. And so, in essence, what Satan was telling Christ is he was saying, if you are the Son of God, in other words, the Father said you are his beloved Son, but are you really who God says you are? That was the title of the sermon in week two. You are not who God says you are. What a song Kylie sang today. I am who you say I am. (laughs) I loved it. And Satan will come and say, if you really are God's child, like you think, what was he saying to Christ? If you are who you think you are, then why would the Father lead you into hunger? Why, Why are you experiencing hunger? So turn these stones Turn them into loaves of bread. What was he trying to do? It's the same temptation you and I face today. Satan was saying, Christ, your physical needs are greater than your spiritual needs. And he does the same thing to us today. He says, no, no, no. What The material things of life, your comfort, your income, your retirement, your luxuries, the things that you enjoy, your hobbies, your interests, the things that make you happy, those are greater priorities than spiritual priorities. And so things like church and things like small groups, things like Studying our Bible, things like memorizing and applying scripture to our life. Those things take a low back seat to the important things like work and income and all of this and that. No, see, it's just the reverse in God's eyes. God says, seek first the kingdom of God, Matthew six thirty three, and all these other things shall be added to you. You understand So it's important for us to understand this first temptation. In essence, he said, put your physical needs above your spiritual. But Christ overcame him with scripture. And Christ didn't fall for the temptation. In the second temptation, which we studied last week, we saw that what Satan's goal was to get Christ to seek man's approval. What did he say in essence? Now, watch this. Because what he was saying was, Christ, if you are who you think you are, remember what he said? If you are the son of God. Then throw yourself off this wall. 450 foot drop off the temple wall. This time Satan quotes scripture. Cast yourself down and the angels will come and they'll they'll rescue you. And what's what's he saying? He's saying everyone who's here at this temple, they're going to watch you be rescued. And then people will follow you. You know what the second temptation was about? It was about man's approval. What he's saying is, Jesus, if you are who you say you are, then why is no one following you? If you are who you think you are, then why do you not have better results? Do something spectacular. Do something miraculous. Do something that people will see and then they'll believe. What's he doing? He's trying to get Jesus to act independently of God's will. And you know he does the same to us. He'll tell us man's approval matters. And let me tell you, it never matters in the eyes of God. Never. So, if the first temptation had to do with instant food... And the second temptation had to do with instant fame. Do something spectacular. Do something miraculous that everyone will see. Well, then what does the third temptation have to do with? This third and final and great temptation has to do with instant fortune. Let's read it together. Matthew chapter 4, beginning in verse number 8. Let's read together. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. So what's he saying to Jesus? Well, in essence, this is what the temptation is. He's saying, Jesus, you have come to this earth to establish the kingdom of God. You remember what Jesus said to the first people, groups of people that he healed? He told them, the kingdom of God has come near you. What a glorious thought. 
The kingdom of God has come near you. Jesus came to establish the kingdom of God. What's the kingdom of God? That's the rule, the exercise of God's authority on the earth. See, what happens when someone seeks forgiveness of their sins, that's the kingdom of God being exercised. When someone lets go of unforgiveness or they let go of hatred or they let go of anger or they let go of past it. What is that? And they say, no, I forgive you in the name of Jesus. That's the kingdom of God being exercised. And when he stood before Pilate, what did he say before Pilate said, my kingdom's not of this world. I don't seek the kingdoms of this world. My kingdom comes of God. So he came to establish the kingdom of God. That was his purpose. Well, what's Satan telling him in this temptation? He's saying, Jesus, for you to do this thing the Father's way, you know what that means. That means Calvary. In order for you to have the kingdom of God the way God wants it done, here's what you're going to have to do. You're going to have to suffer and you're going to have to die a terrible death upon the cross. And do you know what this temptation is? It's a Satan's way of saying, Jesus, bypass Calvary. Jesus... Get out of the suffering. Bypass the crucifixion. In other words, this is the essence of the temptation. Take the easy way out. And so what does he do? He offers the pride of life. And let me tell you, Satan has three main tricks. And you know what they are? The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 and 16. It's the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. These desires that are in our humanity, he preys upon that. He plays upon that. And here with Christ, because Christ is now wrapped in humanity, he has his deity, but he certainly has the humanity as well. And he tries to appeal to the pride of life. And here's what he does. He shows Jesus the kingdoms of the world. I can't imagine what Jesus saw. Was it the glory of Rome? Was it the splendor of Greece? I don't know. It probably was spectacular what he saw. And here's what he told Jesus. I will give you all of this, all the wealth, all of the fame. I'll give you all of this if you'll do one thing. Fall down right now and worship me. And you can bypass the suffering. Now, as we've said throughout the entire study, was Jesus in jeopardy? A falling prey to Satan? Absolutely not. Not even up for debate. Not even a question to even concern ourselves with. God doesn't sin and God can't sin. All right? So what was the purpose? The purpose is to show us how to handle such temptations. The purpose is to show us that Christ could withstand such temptation. That when you and I face temptations, we can run to him and he will have the power to help us. That's the purpose of this text. So here he shows him the kingdoms of the world and all of their glory, all of their riches, all of their fame. And the temptation here is to bypass the suffering of Calvary. Let me tell you, friends, Satan knows that what God leads us through, those painful experiences of our life, will be the most profitable for you spiritually. How many of you can say amen? I've experienced that before. The most painful experiences are always the most profitable spiritually. But what will he do? He'll come to us and he'll say, no, if God really loved you, then why would God allow you to suffer? If God truly loved you, then why would he put this upon you? If God really loved you, why would he not make a way out? But no, listen to what the Bible says. This is why it's crucial that you and I understand the Bible. God does make a way out. Do you realize that? Because the Bible said he's not going to put more on us than what we can handle, but with it, make a way of escape. Do you know what the word picture is of making a way of escape? It's being in a long, narrow valley and finding a trail that leads upward. And do you know what that trail that leads upward is? It's the word of God. It's the people of God. 
It's the house of God. It's the things of God. And when you surround yourself with those things of God, you're going to find that trail that leads upward and you're going to have a way of escape out of every temptation. Amen. It's important that we understand these truths. So the same temptation, he says to Christ, listen, you do this and you'll bypass all the suffering. He'll do the same to us. He'll say, listen, if God loved you, you wouldn't suffer the way you are. But listen, friend, that's not true. God ordains certain experiences for us to walk through. You realize that? He ordains it. Say, Chad, how can you prove that? James chapter 1, verse 2. Count it all joy when you encounter various trials. What's that mean? Count it all joy. You know what the word count is in the Greek there? It literally is a financial term. It literally means to set down and calculate. You count it. You mark it as joy. Have you ever counted things as joy? Have you ever sat down? I know you've done this because I've done this. Have you ever sat down and go, oh my gosh, if it can break, it has broke. Right? If it can go wrong, it has gone wrong. This has went wrong. This has went wrong. I remember 2012, me and Sadie call that the Great Depression of 2012. I mean, our heat pump went out. Our lawnmower broke, our car broke, our pets' heads were falling off. Not really, but, you know, if you know the movie, it's what it felt like. Everything that was going wrong, it could go wrong, and it was a horrible season. And and you know what we learned to do? Instead of counting, oh, my gosh, this broke, this went wrong, this has happened, this. No, the Bible says, count it as joy. Count it up as joy when you... Encounter. See, that word encounter is very important. Some translations say meet, some say encounter. But what does the original Greek say? You know what the original word is? A calendar appointment. And see, God has divine dates that we walk through trouble. Divine dates that we walk through trial. Divine time. Just as the Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness to be tested of the devil, He will lead us in difficult seasons. And what do you do? You don't panic. You don't fret. You don't get overwhelmed. You don't quit. What do you do? You learn to do exactly what Jesus did. Do you understand? We go through these seasons and we count it as joy. Well, what joy is there? The fact that God's sovereign and he's not going to put more on you than what you're able to bear. He's going to make a way of escape for you. You're not left to yourself. We're going to end today by seeing when the devil left, angels came and ministered to Jesus. And I'm going to show you how the same thing happens to us. We're not alone. Amen. Now, verse number 8, let's look at this. It says, again, the devil took him to a very high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world. I love that word, again. It wouldn't just be wonderful if the devil just left you alone, period. But he doesn't, does he? There's always an again. (laughs) There's always an and then. Listen, my friend, you're not going to defeat the devil in one area of your life, and he look at you and go, oh, well, no use in trying anymore. No, he'll always come back. As a matter of fact, Luke records in chapter 4, verse 13, in the same story, Luke says that the devil left him until a more opportune time. Satan never left Jesus alone. Jesus won round three right here, and there was a season of rest. But let me tell you, he was right back. And he didn't leave Jesus alone. He's not going to leave you alone. You have to learn how to deal with the devil. And if you don't know how to deal with him, he's going to slap you down at will. But you can learn the way Jesus did. What did we say in the beginning of this series? Jesus didn't use any divine ability. Do you know why? The only things he used are the resources that are available to every believer today. God's word, prayer, and fasting. And that's what he defeated the devil with. And that's how you and I deal with him. So he says again, he took him to a very high mountain. He showed him the kingdoms of the world and all of their glory. Now, listen to this. Some scholars debate, did Satan have the ability to give Jesus the kingdoms of the world? Some say yes, because he's the prince of the power of the air. He's the God of this world. That's what the Bible says. But then other scholars say no, he didn't have that ability. It's not an issue worth dividing hairs over, but in my estimation, he did not have the ability And let me tell you two reasons why I don't feel like 
Satan had the ability to deliver on this promise. Well, number one, Satan is not sovereign. Only God is sovereign. And Satan is the God of this world in the sense he's the God of this worldly system that opposes the things of God. So in church, when we say something is worldly, what do we mean by the fact it's worldly? What we mean is that it opposes the things of God. Can you think of things that are worldly right now? Things that oppose things that somebody's car alarm's going off. Can you hear that? Somebody's car alarm's going off. I hear it. Anyways, that's the second Sunday that's happened. Somebody check that out. Ben's checking it out. Thank you. So, where am I at? Oh, worldliness. So, if something is worldly, we can focus extra good right now, right? You don't have a problem doing that. You that are like squirrel, you just, you go on and do your thing. Again, now would be a good time for a bathroom break, all right? But for the rest of us, let's focus in. Worldliness. What is worldliness? It's anything that opposes the things of God. And what opposes you spiritually, to you, that's worldly. To you, what hinders you spiritually, that's worldly. You should avoid those things. Hang on, I have to refocus. Where am I? Where was I going with that? Oh, so did Satan have, that's, that's it. And it, thank you, it quit. Okay, <laughs> now we're back. <laughs> it reset. So did Satan have the ability to hand Jesus the kingdoms of the world? Some say no, some say yes. Those who say yes interpret the verse that he's the God of this world. But listen, he's the God of this worldly system. So when things, so when things influence people away from God, who's behind that? Satan. But does that mean that he's over the kingdoms of the world? No. Because he's not sovereign. The Bible says in Psalm 24, 1, the Earth is the Lord's and all they that dwell therein. The earth is the Lord. You don't ever put Satan's ability above God's ability. He's on a very short leash. And that leash is called God's sovereignty. You never give him more power than what he has, right? So in my view, this was a lie. He didn't have the ability to give Christ the kingdoms of the world because God alone is sovereign. Number two, because the Bible does say he's a liar and the father of lies. Anything that comes out of his mouth is a lie. I don't believe this was legitimate. I don't think he had the power. He didn't have the ability. He didn't have the capability to give Jesus the kingdoms of the world. Absolutely not. So, if you're taking notes, you may want to note this. Whereas Satan does not have ownership, he does have influence. Listen to Revelation 12, 9. And the great dragon, which refers to Satan, was thrown down, that ancient serpent. Those are metaphors for who Satan is. That great serpent. Who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. Isaiah 14, 12. How you have fallen from heaven, O day star, son of dawn. How you are cut down to the ground. You who laid the nations low. Yes, he deceives the nations. Yes, he leads humanity astray. But all he has is influence, not ownership. I don't believe he could have given Christ the kingdoms of the world. So what is the point then? Well, Christ was wise enough to understand the link between worship and service. Now follow me for a moment here and we'll begin to work our way to the end. What did Satan tell Christ? He said, listen, all you have to do is fall down right now. Fall down. Worship me. And I'll give you the kingdoms of the world and all of their glory. Satan wanted from Christ what he wanted from the very beginning. And that was worship. Now, as Americans, we don't seem to think deeply about worship. Because for us, worship is categorized into religious settings. So... If you're not a religious person, then you're certainly not worshiping anything. 
or if you're not religious at the moment, or you're not doing a religious thing, then it's not worship. But that's not necessarily true. Because you have to understand where the word worship comes from. Our English word worship comes from the meaning of worth. W-O-R-T-H. Worth ship. What is worthy? What has value? What has worth? What we treasure. You understand what I'm saying? According to the Bible, what people value, what they treasure, what they love, they worship. Have you ever saw worship in, through that perspective? That's a completely different viewpoint. And so the danger for us being in the society that we live in is we think, oh, well, if I'm not religious, then I'm not worshiping anything. Or if I'm not in a religious setting, then I'm not worshiping anything. But no, let me tell you. You show me what you put value on, I'll show you what you worship. You show me where your money goes, where your time goes, where your interest goes, where your energy goes, where your affections go, and I'll show you what you worship. And that's why in our society, especially, we have to be guarded and we have to be careful that we don't put worship, we don't put value on things above God. And let me assure you, it is incredibly easy to do. And so Satan says, fall down right here, worship me. Worship me. But see, Jesus, when he answered Satan, Jesus took it a step further because he knew the link. Jesus said, you shall worship the Lord only and serve him. Do you know what Jesus is teaching us? There's a link between worship and service. Jesus was wise enough to know what you worship, you ultimately serve. And let me tell you, I don't have to elaborate on this because you know as well as I know it's true. Our society worships money. We worship things. We worship hobbies. We worship our interests. Say, Chad, how do you say that? Because where does our interest go? Where does our attention go? What gets our affections? What gets our Income. What gets our energy? You and I must be careful as Christ followers that we go, oh, yes, I may enjoy this. Oh, yes, yes, I may like this. This may be a hobby of mine. This may be a passion of mine. But I'm not going to put so much value on it, so much worth on it, that I'm going to put it above how much I love the Lord. Does that make sense to everyone? And what Jesus teaches us is what you worship, you ultimately serve. What do you mean serve? It gets your attention. It gets your energy. It gets your affection. So it would be wise for us today to do a quick, a short inventory of our life and say, what does have our greatest chunks of attention? What does have our money? What does have our energy? What has our affections? What do we truly love? And you and I, we inventory these things and we say, does our life really line up to what God's word wants for us? Isn't that good for all of us to do? I'm not throwing stones at any of us. We all have the potential to love something too much. We all have the potential to put something above the Lord in our life. And that's why we must have eyes wide open to it. And we must understand this is a real watch out, especially in the society that you and I live so, as we work our way to the end here, this fascinates me. Now, we come to my most favorite part, verse 10. After dealing with the devil through hunger, through confusion and frustration, no doubt Jesus, he was feeling his humanity as strong as ever. I wouldn't, I wouldn't doubt that he wasn't exhausted mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually. Every way you could be exhausted, he was exhausted. And no doubt he felt vulnerable. And that's why when you feel vulnerable, you should go straight to Jesus because he understands. And now he's dealt with the devil through three fierce temptations. All three rounds. He beat the devil's brains out with scripture. 
He didn't debate him. He didn't dialogue with him. He didn't discuss topics. He didn't say, you're right, you're wrong. He quoted scripture, and that was enough. What a lesson that teaches us, amen? God's word is enough to deal with the devil. Well, now he's had enough, and Jesus says, be gone. Let's understand a couple of principles out of this. First of all, it makes me think of James chapter 4, verse 7. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. That's a verse every person in this room ought to memorize and put and apply to our life. Resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. That's what Jesus taught us. You don't talk to the devil. You don't debate. You don't ask yourself, well, maybe this is God. Maybe it's not. Maybe this is good. Maybe it's not. Maybe I should. Maybe I should. No, you don't do that. You, you get settled in God's word. You follow the spirit of God and you resist the devil. You resist him. Through all this issue with blindness that I've been facing, I, that's been the, the constant balance for me. I know that God's allowing me to face what I face, but I know this is ultimately from the devil. Even though God is allowing it for whatever time period he's allowing, this is ultimately an attack from the enemy to try to destroy my ministry. So what do I do? I submit myself to God. Okay, God, I'll walk this valley as long as you say walk it. But while I'm walking, I resist the devil. I resist his work. I resist his hindrances. I resist his discouragement. I resist his oppression. I resist all of that in Jesus' name. But I submit myself to the Lord. Just as the Spirit led Christ into the wilderness, you, we submit ourselves to the Lord, but we resist the devil. And finally, he said, be gone. You know, there comes a time in your life where you just have to get mad at the enemy and you have to say, go, flee from me in Jesus' name. Go, go now. It's all right to do that. Amen. You have the power and you have the authority through the name of Jesus to say, go, go from my family, go from my job, go from my life, go from my health, go be gone in Jesus name and put him to flight. You don't sit there and let Satan mess with your family and let him bring up. No, you put him to flight immediately. You do what Jesus taught us to do. Amen. Amen. So many Christians sit around, they just let Satan do whatever he wants. No, you don't do that. You resist him and you say, go. One of my favorite pastors, I was listening to his thoughts on this text. Pastor Erwin Lutzer, oh, I love that man. And he brought up an illustration that I want to share with you because it touched my heart so much and it was so fitting. Not only did Jesus resist the devil, see, he resisted him on his own. But listen, you and I aren't Jesus. We don't go at Satan alone. We need each other, right? And Pastor Lutzer shared he was watching the animal planet on television. And there was a great herd of buffalo. You know how big buffalo are. You know how massive of a beast they are. And one of the buffalo got separated from the herd. He was a few hundred feet away. And there were two or three lions lying in wait. What's the Bible say Satan does? He prowls around as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And the lions attacked this buffalo. One lion took his back leg. Another lion took his front leg. One lion that wasn't very smart tried to take its head. But you know what that buffalo did? He threw him about six, eight feet up in the air. The commentator said that the lion died the next day. But they got that buffalo to the ground, and you can imagine they devoured it. But do you know what Dr. Lutzer said that shocked him most? He said there were 60, 70, 80 buffalo standing, watching. Now, to his credit, you and I have never been a buffalo. We don't know how they think. What do you suppose would have happened had seven or eight or nine or ten of those buffalo charged those three lions? They would have put them to flight. Two or three lions is no match for a herd of buffalo. And do you know what happens with Christians? Satan comes into your family. 
He comes into your household. He takes your legs out. And do you know what all the other Christians do? We stand there eating grass and watch it happen. That ought not be. What would happen if Satan attacks you and I get with you and five others get with you? What happens when Satan attacks me and eight or nine of you gather around me and you say, I'm going to pray for you. We're going to put Satan to flight. Let me tell you, he is no match for the people of God. Do you understand? No match. No match. But what does he do? He isolates you. He gets you away from the things of God. He gets you away from the people of God. He gets you away from where the protection is and the help is and the strength is. And then he devours. But if we would come to one another's aid, that wouldn't happen. And I tell you, hear my pastoral heart. That's why small groups matter the most. I'm telling you, if you look around this room today and you don't know maybe two, three, four people, you don't look around this room and you don't know how to pray for the people that's in this room and people aren't praying for you, I promise you, you're doing it all wrong. You and I should be able to look at one another and know what's happening in our lives. That's being a family. That's being, that's being a church flock. That's being, that's being together in this thing. And listen, we're not called to just do church together. We're called to do life together. Life. And I should know your struggles and you should know my struggles. And we should bear one another up. And we should bear with one another and love one another and encourage one another. And most of all, pray for one another. But how would that happen if we don't know each other's names? How will that happen if we look around and the room is full every week, but we only know three, four, five people? How will that happen? It won't. And we'll be like that herd of buffalo. Oh, we're all getting fed today, right? <laughs> we're, all, we're all grazing on God's word right now. But there's some of you in this room today that Satan has your legs and he's got your back legs and your front legs. And he's this close from getting the jugular. And you need people around you who will help fight him off. I'm not Jesus and you're not Jesus. We're not meant to go against him alone. We're meant to do it together. And we need to join together and fight him off and pray him out and rebuke him and resist him and say you're going to go in Jesus' name no more. But it takes an army to do it. And some of you are not on the field with us. You're watching from a distance and you like the music and you even like me and you like the atmosphere and that's great. I'm glad. I'm so glad you're here. But listen, we don't need you to fill a chair. They fill up anyway. We don't need you to fill the chair. We need you to engage. Say, Chad, how do I do that? You make it a point. You're going to learn people. You're going to learn names. You're going to ask people, where do you work? How many kids you got? How are things going? Invite people to your home. Oh, isn't that weird? We don't do that no more, do we? Invite people to your home. And if you don't like that, invite them for coffee. And make it a point to get out of your comfort zone. Get out of your comfort zone. And say, listen, I, I, I'm not just going to get to know people for this whole fact that I'll have more friends. I'm going to get to know you so I can pray for you. Come to prayer meeting on Tuesday night. Do you know we're having 50 and 60 come every Tuesday night just to pray? Join us. Join us. Pray. Engage. And you'll find doing church the way God designed it to do is far better than sitting in rows Sipping on coffee and tapping your foot to the music. That's not what this thing is all about. We're to resist the devil together. Amen. Now. Let's learn this last part. <laughs> he told him to be gone. As we said last week, Jesus quoted from the book of Deuteronomy. Of all the scriptures Jesus quoted, he quotes most from the book of Deuteronomy. And in this case, he quoted Deuteronomy 6.13. Now it says, 
that after he rebuked him and resisted him, verse 11, the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. Mm. What does this mean? Well, what it tells me is that God does not leave us to ourselves. Let me give you a wonderful scripture. Now, what do we say? We know Satan didn't leave him alone permanently because Luke 4.13 says he left waiting for a more opportune time. Okay. Now, note this. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14. Perhaps you don't know this verse. This is a lovely verse. Are not all angels ministering spirits? Ministering means servants, serving. A minister of the gospel means a servant of the gospel. Are all angels not serving, not ministering spirits? Well, ministers to who? Sent to serve those who will inherit salvation. <laughs> oh. Do you remember what we learned in the last series with the armor of God? How many angels that Revelation 12 says there are? Does anybody remember that? How many angels are there in heaven? Uh, I have to check my time because this is okay. Okay, I've got a few minutes. All right. Say amen if you're with me. I promise this is where we're close. Look, I'm putting my notes away. Okay, we're done. We're closing. No more. Okay. Follow me. Oh, goodness. <laughs> Thank you, Lord, for your word. How many angels are there? We don't know, but John gives us a clue. See, John says that there are maraud of maraud. Well, what's a maraud? You're like, I don't know. I think that's my husband. <laughs> no, that's, no, what's a maraud? The highest numeric number in the Greek language is 10,000. Maraud is tens of thousands of 10,000. And John says, when it comes to the angels of God, there are maraud tens of thousands upon maraud, tens of thousands. And Hebrews 1.14 says, are they all not servants, ministering spirits, servants who are sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? Whew. Let me tell you, you're not alone. And there'll be times that you feel like you can't take another step. And God will send his angels and you'll feel grace come right up under you and sustain you. The Bible even says there'll be times that you entertain angels unaware. God will send his angels and you won't even know that they're in your company. But they'll come and they'll help and they'll come serve. During the revival, a lady came to me. And she was an elderly lady. And she said, I was dying of cancer some years ago. I can't remember what cancer she had. She said, I was dying. And she said, I walked out of my house and I walked down my driveway going to the mailbox. And she said, a man met me on the sidewalk. And she said, that man said, God is healing you. And he walked away. She went to the next doctor visit, no cancer. She said, I have no doubt God sent me an angel. Are they not all ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? Does everybody have a guardian angel? It's not what the Bible teaches. But those who are born again, he gives his angels charge concerning us. Amen. Amen. You believe that today? I believe it with all of my heart. With all of my heart. You know, I have to confess to you. God convicted me some months back. When we were going through our Acts series, and we're getting ready to go back into Acts later this month to finish the book. 
But God convicted me because we encountered angels so often throughout the book. You remember? An angel would appear to someone. And I would crack a joke throughout those times. And I would say, and I, and I said it multiple times. And I said, you know, it wouldn't do God any good to send an angel to me because I'd fall over of a heart attack. You know, it would be like, <laughs> so what's the point? And the Lord convicted me. The Lord said, I know you're being funny, but listen, don't say that anymore. Are they not all ministering spirits sent to help, sent to serve the people of God? The Lord said, you have no idea who's in your midst. You don't know who's praying for you. You don't know who I'm sending to help you, Chad. Don't make light of it anymore. And I repented and I haven't made light of it anymore. As a matter of fact, I find myself praying, Lord, would you, would you send your angels to help me, Lord? What did they do for Christ? See, God was not going to let his son die in the wilderness. And he's not going to let you die either. He's not going to let you starve and, and, and go through your wilderness experience and die of anxiety or die of stress or die. No, 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 no. Those angels came and they fed him and they ministered to him. Do you trust God to take care of you? Because let me tell you what you have. You have a father who loves you fiercely. You have the son who ever lives to make intercession for those who are his. You have the Holy Spirit who fills us, enables us, empowers us, guides us, and helps us, and comforts us. You have the Word of God that sustains us, equips us, counsels us. You have the house of God to come to and worship. You have the people of God who will pray for you and help you and encourage you. You're not going to die in the wilderness. You're not going to lose hope today. You're not going to faint today. No. Because God, if he has to, is going to send his angels to minister to you just as he did his son, Jesus Christ. And let me assure you, he has maraud upon maraud, tens of thousands upon tens of thousands, ready to help the people of God. Let's bow our heads. If you're here today, Satan's attacking you. He's attacking your family. Listen, we have many people wanting to pray with you right now. We have a prayer team, an altar team, who will come pray with you. I don't care if this is your first time here or if you're a staple here. I don't care. If you need prayer today, just slip out of your seat. Walk up here to this altar. You can kneel. You can stand. You can sit. Whatever you need to do. But why don't you slip out today and let a few people gather around you and put Satan to flight. Why don't you come right now? Why don't you come? And listen, when people pray with you, don't just say, I need prayer. Tell them what it is. Is it your marriage you need prayer in? Is it your job you need prayer in? Is it your children? Is it your health? Where has Satan sunk his teeth in that you need people to help fight him off? Listen, don't fall today. Come and let us help you. Satan has you isolated. Come, we'll gather around you. Come right now. Right now. As others are praying, you come. You come and find help. Lord, we thank you for what your spirit has taught us today. For what your spirit has showed us today. Lord, we need strength today. We need strength today. We need help fighting off the enemy. He would isolate. He would discourage. He would depress. He would try to come against. But in the name of Jesus today, we resist him with all that we have. And what do we have? We have the spirit of God. We have the word of God. We have the people of God. We're in the house of God. And we resist him with all that we have in Jesus' name. We resist him. We resist him. We resist him. 
Where do you need prayer today? Where do you need help today? Resist him. So Jesus, following your lead, following your pattern, we say by faith today to the enemy, be gone from us. Be gone from our home. Be gone from our health. Be gone from the ways that you tempt us and the ways you isolate us. Be gone. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. We call upon you, Lord. We call upon you for unique strength, Lord. Strength that we've never felt. Unique strength. Unique grace. Strength for this situation. Grace for this situ- this encounter, this trial, this appointment, this calendar appointment, this calendar trial. Strength. We need that, Lord. We need that.